Hi, I'm David. Welcome to the Wind Pig Sly Observatory. This is part one of a series of videos documenting the history and development of my backyard observatory. In this episode, we'll see how the observatory got started and its transition from backyard to backyard observatory. Hope you'll enjoy the show. I've been interested in astronomy since humans first flew into space. So it seems like I've always had a telescope or binoculars to peer into the night sky. But it wasn't until 2006 that I started practicing astronomy regularly from my suburban backyard. I live in Burlington, Ontario, which is part of what's called the Golden Horseshoe. It's a highly developed area that wraps along the north and western shores of Lake Ontario to the Niagara Peninsula. The golden part of that moniker could easily be a reference to the light that spills up into the sky each night. After researching light pollution in my area, I learned that I live in a Bortle Class 7 zone. A brief definition here. The Bortle scale was proposed by John E. Bortle in the February 2001 edition of Sky and Telescope magazine. It's a numeric scale graded from class 1 to class 9, where the lower numbers are indicative of very dark skies and the higher numbers represent the very light polluted skies. I live within the boundaries of a medium-sized city that's jammed up alongside other medium-sized cities. Lots of street lights and parking lots as well as commercial and residential lighting. It never really gets dark here unless there's a power outage. In 2001, I bought a Celestron Nexstar 5 as my first go-to telescope. It was a great instrument, quick and easy to set up, and provided wonderful views of many celestial targets. As free time allowed, I would take it to the backyard, set it up, and spend a night under the sky. It was around then that my interest in astronomy blossomed into a passion. Over the next few years, I took the telescope out more and more often and searched for the wonders that my local horizon would allow. Let's talk about my local horizon now. Our backyard is in a tree bowl, with a clear view of the sky from east to north and a bit to the northwest. Facing north, the local horizon is about 35 degrees, and as we look to our right, there is my neighbor's house and a line of houses moving down the hill, maintaining the same horizon angle. Continuing past east, there's a rising line of trees that block the homes on the street behind us. Moving through south, the line of trees gets taller and taller until the local horizon is about 60 to 70 degrees. The same aspect prevails to the west until we come back to our house and the north where the horizon returns to about 35 to 40 degrees. This means that the trees block my view of the ecliptic, the path where the sun, moon, and planets appear to travel across the sky. Still, there's a lot of sky that is observable from the bottom of my tree bowl. As I was saying, around 2006, I got bit by the astronomy bug and went down with a thud. I started going out every clear night to view what I could in the sky. If an object from the next star 5 database pointed me into the trees or the back of a house, then I would move on to the next object. Around this time, I started using planetarium software to plan my outings with an eye to working around the limitations of my location. As these outings to the backyard became more frequent, I started including a few creature comforts from my observing location. A seat, a small table for eyepieces, etc. The observatory got started with a set of blocks that were set into the ground where the tripod rests. This simple set of blocks grew to include concrete pavers to keep my feet out of the inevitable mud that comes each spring. A screw into the ground dog tether attached to the bottom of the tripod helped damp vibrations. In the winter I dug out astronomy snow forts. Though I didn't know it at the time, my mind had already started planning for an observatory. Any amateur astronomer will tell you, the largest part of our time involves setting up equipment and tearing it down. Back then, I had to haul all the gear from our garage to the backyard, set it up, and tear it down at the end of each night. When there was more than one clear night, I would cover the telescope and uncover it as needed. 
Inevitably, I would still have to tear it all down to store it in the garage. By late 2007, I had started taking my first steps into astrophotography. I was also learning how to connect the camera and telescope to a computer so that it could navigate the skies and take pictures from a desktop. There were rainy and cloudy days during that period where I would set up the scope and computer in the garage and fly the sky from the indoors. During those sessions, I taught myself the skills and pitfalls of electronically assisted astronomy. These were the first of many challenges along the way. Over the ensuing years, I persisted with the hobby and expanded my skills with camera and telescope. The astronomy hardware and software inventory grew modestly and my observing and photography skills were being sharpened. The next Star 5 was regularly being pushed to its limitations. At that time, my astrophotography consisted mostly of prime focus pictures of the moon and the few planets that were available in winter and spring. Sometimes my subjects would even be in focus, but they were all thrilling to me. Over time, I persevered through winter and summer conditions to sharpen and expand my skill set. At the end of those late nights, while packing the telescope away, I pondered the advantages of an observatory. Someday. In early 2009, I realized that my trusty little Nexstar 5 had almost reached its limits, and I began looking for a larger telescope to help expand my skills. Let's face it. There was a pretty hefty dollop of aperture fever mixed in there too. In early September 2009, I bought a lightly used Celestron Nexstar 11 GPS Schmidt Kazagrain telescope. During the earliest outings with the 11 inch, I found my experience with the 5 inch telescope was directly transportable to the newer 11 inch scope. I had the camera and computer connecting to the next star 11 in very short order. So the era of the yard cannon began. The introduction of the next star 11 also introduced added complexity to my setup. As my observing and photography developed, so did the need to have a more permanent setup. During the next couple of years, the equipment list grew an equatorial wedge, eyepieces, filters, adapters, a new mount, and the introduction of a guide camera for astrophotography. With the expanded equipment list came greater complexity to the setup. Take that as it takes much longer to set up and be ready for a session. During these sessions, I started to think more seriously about a permanent observatory. My mind's eye saw a gleaming dome covering my precious telescope equipment. The reality of having an observatory was understated compared to where my wishful thinking took my imagination. For the next few years, there wasn't a lot of concrete planning toward an observatory. I just got out and did the astronomy thing as often as time and commitments allowed. I gradually began considering the possibility of having a more permanent setup. As these thoughts took shape, I started searching for feasible solutions to the observatory question. Each passing winter motivated me all the more. Those who don't practice astronomy during the winter in the northern temperate zone wouldn't know the pain involved with handling frozen telescope parts. There are many pieces of kit that need to be connected and some of them that cannot be done easily while wearing gloves. Of course, at minus 15 Celsius, that's five degrees Fahrenheit, it doesn't take long for exposed skin to start to feel the very painful effects of handling cold metal parts with bare hands. The more often I got the equipment out, the more I thought about having an observatory. In the spring of 2011, I began seriously searching for a personal observatory or home observatory to get a feel for what was out there. I found many great examples of home-built observatory solutions. Some of them were amazingly elegant and simple. Some of them were for millionaires row. Like many other amateur astronomers, I was looking for a practical and budget-friendly solution. There were some well-done, do-it-yourself, roll-off observatories that appealed to me. There were also some dome-type observatories that required more construction skills than I had available. 
Some of the more attractive DIY solutions involve modifying plastic garden sheds. Very doable given my skills and tools. During one of these searches, I came across a Canadian-based company that sold complete plans for a roll-off roof type observatory, Skyshed. While I was investigating Skyshed's other products, I first learned about the Skyshed pod. The pod, or personal observatory dome, is a simple structure made of high-density polyethylene, HDPE. This is the material used to make garden sheds and playground equipment. It's a durable plastic that stands up well to seasonal changes. I especially liked that the pod had the traditional dome style and that it was a Canadian company. The pod has several optional features to personalize your pod to individual needs. Given the simplicity of construction and its prospects for use over the long term, I felt like my search had just ended. Over the next few years, I continued to use my backyard setup more and more. The concrete pavers has expanded to a sizable footprint. I was also leaving the telescope set up between uses, covered by a tarp. As time rolled on, I dreamed more and more of the day that I'd be able to leave the telescope set up in a sky shed pod. While I continued searching for personal observatory solutions, my mind had already been made up. Through this time, I began mocking up the footprint of a pod and looking for a good location for it. I had originally considered placing the pod on our deck, but my darling astronomy widow nixed the idea as being a vexation to her spirit if it was placed right outside our kitchen window. Beauty is in the eye of the beholder, they say. My wife, however, interested in the product of my hobby, was not going to allow the pod to be the first and nearly only thing she would see out our back window. In time, I found that the location I was using for my setup was in fact the best possible placement given the limitation of our yard, aka the tree bowl. As a result of a pie-in-the-sky windfall in the spring of 2012, I was finally able to start down the long-awaited road to getting my own observatory. Suddenly, my planning for an observatory went into high gear. But that's a tale for the next episode. I hope you enjoyed part one. Next time, we'll be exploring planning and construction of the paver base and the sky shed pod itself. Please like and share if you enjoyed this video and we'll see you at the observatory the next time.